What we've got here is a nice big piece of English walnut. If you caught the first episode of the tree map series, you had a little lesson on the difference between the black walnut, which is native to North America, it's what we made Missouri out of, and the English walnut, which is not native to North America, but this is the tree that gives us the walnuts you're almost certainly familiar with. I've actually personally never worked with or even seen English walnut wood, and while the black walnut deservedly gets a ton of attention for the beauty of its wood, something tells me we're gonna get something really pretty out of this right here. I mean, check it out, we got two crotches. All right, so I'm gonna cut into this log, throw on the lathe, I'm gonna try to make a nice big platter out of this, preserve as much of these two crotches as I can. And then once I'm done with that, I'm gonna grab some English walnuts and bake up something nice to put on this brand new platter. I mean, we can't just have an empty platter with no dessert to show off, right? The English walnut, Juglans regia, has a pretty interesting history. Its precise original native range is difficult to know for sure, thanks to millennia of human cultivation, which naturalized it throughout Eurasia. Our best estimation is that the original native range spans from the Balkans down through the Himalayas and into southwest China. The primary center of origin for the species historically has been the region around modern Iran, which is why alongside the names English walnut and common walnut, the tree is also sometimes called the Persian walnut. It does best in rich, deep soil with full sun and long summers and can grow quite tall, upwards of 120 feet, sometimes with massive trunks reaching 6 feet in diameter. Walnuts are culinarily considered a nut, but botanically they're actually a seed. The fruit of the walnut tree are droops, which grow in a cluster of two to five, ripening in autumn with a green fleshy husk. That flesh eventually opens up, kind of like a little demogorgon face, to reveal the brown corrugated nut inside before falling to the ground. Walnuts just might be, to our knowledge, the oldest domesticated tree food. They're believed to have contributed significantly to the diet of early hunter-gatherers and were domesticated sometime around 7,000 years ago. Walnut trees were subsequently cultivated and traded throughout ancient Greece along the Silk Road, and the Romans called walnuts Jupiter's royal acorn. English colonists brought the tree to the Americas in the 1600s, which is how it developed the English walnut moniker to differentiate the tree from the native black walnut, despite England never being a major walnut-producing country. The walnuts that the English walnut produces are the walnuts you're really familiar with. Even though the black walnut is what's actually native to the US, it's difficult to hull and its shell is extremely hard, so it's not cultivated in commercial orchards, while the English walnut most certainly is. And walnuts are used in all sorts of applications, eating them raw or toasted, even pickled, as an ingredient in dishes like cakes, pies, soups, salads, and more. Whole green walnuts can be used to make a liqueur called nochino. Walnut oil is also popular as an ingredient in things like salad dressings. And historically, the walnut was associated with a lot of other benefits, including freshening your breath after eating onions, protecting yourself against poison, and the ancient Greeks believed the walnut to be an aphrodisiac. English walnut wood, as you can see, is quite attractive. Its heartwood can be varying shades of brown or tan, with a sapwood that's almost white. But since its primary value comes from producing nuts, it's rarely used as a commercial lumber like its black walnut cousin. And with that, the platter's all done, and boy, do I really love how this one turned out. The streaks of sapwood, this little bark inclusion, and of course, that patch of crotch wood adding some really great chatoyancy. So now let's make something to serve up on this platter. Starting, of course, with some English walnuts, which I'll spread evenly on a baking sheet and toast in an oven at 375 degrees for about five minutes or until they look nice and toasty. After they've cooled off, it's a quick chop, 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 and let's set these aside for later and pull out the pumpkin because it's October and I'm gonna make some walnut pumpkin bread. This recipe from America's Test Kitchen calls for first cooking a 15 ounce can of pumpkin puree on a stove top, which they say helps remove that tinny flavor that accompanies canned pumpkin. To our pumpkin, we're gonna add a teaspoon of salt, teaspoon and a half of cinnamon, quarter teaspoon nutmeg, one eighth teaspoon cloves, and stir constantly over medium heat until reduced a bit, around six to eight minutes. Remove from heat and add a cup of sugar, a cup of light brown sugar, a half cup of vegetable oil, and four ounces of cream cheese cut into pieces. Stir this up until combined, let it sit for five minutes, and then whisk and don't stop until all those little cream cheese bits are no more. Now a quick trip to the backyard to grab some eggs. Because we're whisking four of them with a quarter cup of buttermilk, adding that to the main mixture and whisking until combined. So I just got done making all of this all over again. Uh, no surprise, I screwed up one of the steps. I forgot to mix in the baking powder and baking soda in with the flour, which meant I got to go all the way back down to the grocery store to get another can of pumpkin. But the good news is, is it's turning out better this time since A, I had a practice round, and B, I wasn't running around filming each step of the process. So. 
Let's get back to folding. Add a teaspoon and a half baking powder and a half teaspoon baking soda to two cups of all-purpose flour. Mix it together and fold it into the pumpkin mixture until combined. And some small lumps of flour sticking around in your mixture is nothing to worry about. Now let's fold in Jupiter's royal acorn itself, our chopped roasted walnuts. For the topping, add five tablespoons brown sugar, a tablespoon flour, teaspoon cinnamon, one eighth teaspoon salt, and a tablespoon soft and unsalted butter. Mix this together with your hands until it looks and feels like wet sand. Very satisfying to touch. Add your pumpkin bread mixture to a pair of greased loaf pans. These are eight by four. Sprinkle the topping on top and place it in a 350 degree oven for 40 to 45 minutes. And look at these gorgeous loaves. You can let them rest in the pan on a wire rack for 20 minutes and then I'll pull them out and let them cool for at least an hour and a half more before it's time to plate them up on our brand new platter. Let's cut it open and check out the inside. I mean, look at all those little droop seeds. Glorious. Holy smokes. Woo! Hey, Miles. That is delicious. Mmm. The cooking of the pumpkin puree is a brilliant move. The walnuts add a perfect crunch with just a tiny complimentary flavor. And lest we forget, big props to our English walnut platter as well. This is an excellent fall time recipe, 10 out of 10, highly recommend. I might just accidentally eat this entire loaf. Uh-oh. Mm -mm 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 -mm.